Uh, we're pleasure to have Gavin Mudd here with us. He is part of the, the extramural, uh, uh, he is the extramural uh, evaluator for ACE. Uh, we go through every five years, we go through uh, evaluation, self-study. Um, every AUA center and department does that. This year was our turn, we did it, and we we're lucky to have him join us, the uh, external uh, you know, evaluator. And we also found out that he knows a lot about mining, and that's what he does for a living. So uh, we thought it was a great match to bring in and, and uh, get his expertise and thoughts on something very ambitious. Uh, he's actually putting the word sustainable and mining together, which we well, question. OK, thank you. OK. Um, before I get into it, I want to explain why I've reached this point, and I guess where I started from. Um, when I was doing my PhD back in the late 1990s, I was looking at one side of a power station with coal ash tailings and, and impacts on groundwater. I remember thinking, I have to do one PhD on this tailings stand. Where's the rest? What's happening to the rest of them? And well, surely we're mining something that's going to run out. And so um, I remember starting to think that, well, actually, if we've got this many problems at one side, what happens if you add them all up? You know, how do you look at that? Not only just in Australia, but actually start to say, well, what's that legacy going to be? You know, and what happens if we start stretching that forward for 50 years or 100 years and look at the scale of mining you know, in 100 years' time? And so, <clears throat> in, you know, at the same time, of course, the industry was going through this sort of process you know, globally in the late 1990s called the, the Global Mining Initiative um, to sort of talk about the fact that, well, mining doesn't have a great track record or its social responsibility or its environmental impacts. Um, you know, issues around economic benefit sharing, um, regulation and so on. Um, and that was really the first time the go of mining we started to acknowledge these things. So that of course was delivered as the uh, Mining Minerals and Sustainable Development Report or project of the uh, Johannesburg Earth Summit um, in, in 2002. And so since then the industry said well, we're committed to contributing to sustainable development. We're no longer going to try and say why it's sustainable. It's a contribution and it's part of a process and so on. And so, really, there's always this complex sort of, you know, um, yeah, paradox. Is mining sustainable, or really should we be talking about it in a responsible way? Because this screen wouldn't work without a whole bunch of metals. Um, we wouldn't be here without the energy provided by mining either. <coughs> Hopefully my voice will hold out pretty well. Um, it should be okay. This is cartoons. I, you know, I love using cartoons in my talks. I think this is an Australian cartoonist called Dr. Tanberg. Um, but I think instantly when we look at that, we think, oh, well, what about the sun? And in Australia, we've actually had huge success in, in building renewable energy. We've actually sh shut down about three gigawatts worth of uh, coal-fired power stations because we've got so many solar panels on homes now. Right. We're actually having really good success, and it's actually something that's really well recognised But getting there. But, but what about Jeff? You know, went well down there. It's probably not ready yet, but typically, though, our industry's response, our government's response is just dig more. Bigger open cut coal mines, drill more holes for gas, and that's really the only way when they're talking about energy down there. That's the way the industry and government's always sort of looked at it. But communities and people are saying, well, no, this century's different. We're going to choose solar panels instead. I could talk a lot more about that, but um, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Uh, so we could look around at infrastructure, but it's here in Yerevan. Anyway. We've got our, our copper wires, our building <coughs> wouldn't be here without very particular metals, whether that's steel or copper. Um, if you look at our standard smartphone, or iPhone in this case, there's about 60 elements in that. Take one or two of those, um, and the functionality completely reduces, or basically the phone won't work, what it say, lithium. The phone would get a lot bigger and heavier again. Europium, you wouldn't get red colour in your screen. And so we're all the user of metals, so we're all involved in the debate, I think, that um, what we need to do. But increasingly, the world's going, well, hang on, if we're looking at the metals that are going into a smartphone or whatever, we do want to make sure they're produced responsibly. If you look at America, there's the, the Dodd-Frank Act, where any metal that's produced in a, a conflict region, such as Central Congo, um, has to be certified that it isn't contributing to conflict. Uh, and it's caused you know, some harm, because sometimes some of the artists out of miners no longer can sell their products anymore because they aren't certified. Um, but overall, um, it's done a lot of good because it means that um, the financial supply to fuel conflict in the Congo and, and that region 
um, has been cut out. But if you look at Grassberg in West Papua, they've dug 5 billion tonnes of tailings and waste rock down the river. And I know that number, it's probably up to 6 billion now, but um, imagine that. Imagine that if you had billions and billions of tonnes you know, going down the rivers of um, Armenia. But in some parts of the world, that's a reality. Certainly in that part of the world it is. It's not far from Australia. So uh, overall, what we need to be able to do, and this is sort of our 21st century challenge, is, you know, uh, Armenia is probably more to the right, parts of Africa probably more to the left, Australia, you know, on the right there. Um, we all want cars, we all want phones, we all want a comfortable lifestyle, well, that's fine. But at the same time, we need to learn some climate. And really, that's one of the big challenges, and I think one of the things, um, you know, I'm constantly trying to sort of really emphasize, both to my students at Monash, um, but also to industry, <coughs> is because of these constraints, we have to think differently, we have to do differently. Right? And people who notice the date on that, of course, it's uh, December 1997, which is when the World Sun um, go got a goal, and we thought we were going to start actually making action on climate change. But um, 20 years later, we're Actually, getting it, but it a long way. Now, George Wigley, this is not a typo, 1556 is the correct time. His uh, book, The Roman Talica, is still considered one of the founding books, of course, of modern mining. Um, and the Australian connection, ironically, in some ways, um, Herbert Hoover. Um, anyone know that name? The American president. The American president. What was he before then? He was a mining engineer. And as a mining engineer, he spent 20 years working in Australia. Um, and his wife was both a geologist and a linguist. Um, and when I say linguist, she was studying old school Latin, um, as well as being a geologist in some ways. hundred years ago, that probably did go class together. Um, and so after working in Australia in the 1890s and early 1900s, um, Herbert Hoover and Leslie Hoover went back to the States and just spent five years translating into Urban Talent. The first chapter is the entire philosophy of mining. Why do we mine? Well, to produce swords that can go kill people. That's not good, but we can make um, kitchen utensils and farming equipment to make more food and feed more people. That's good. This duality, this complex sort of good and bad side of, um, of, of what we do with the things that we mine, um, it was a very honest debate. But from the environmental side, this is one of the you know, very famous quotes. This is centuries ago. And the Greek life, of course, was building on the work that had been done by Romans and by the Greeks and so on as well. <coughs> now, if you're looking at many communities around the world, if you're looking at some of the big controversial mining projects, Pascual Lama on the border of Chile and Argentina and South, um, South America there, um, Pebble in Alaska, um, INAP in Afghanistan, um, for a lot of people, uh, they adamantly oppose mining now in some areas. And for some reasons, it's cultural, like INAP, it's an old Buddhist site from thousands of years ago. Um, for others, it's about environmental risk to salmon. Right, the rivers that flow through the area where the Pebble Cocker Project is, is the biggest salmon breeding ground in the world. It's not something you want to fiddle with. Cocker's incredibly toxic for things like fish. Right. So for a lot of people, they say, well, no, the benefits are just not near the, anywhere near worth the risks. And so these days, we would put sustainability language on that and go, well, social, environmental, and economic. Um, but for many people, that's very real. As it is in Australia, as I'm, as I'm sure it is here, uh, as it is elsewhere. Right. And so what Agricola was acknowledging, he said, yes, things can go wrong. And we have to acknowledge that. Because as, especially as an engineer, my job during my PhD was, well, how do you fix that? Or how do you stop it in the first place? Right. So that's that sort of background, I think. Right. So, <coughs> give me a second. Now, how many people have done some reading on uh, peak oil? Right. There you go. Probably know more than me. Um, how many people have done reading on peak minerals? If you have, you've probably read everything we've written because it's um, everyone assumes minerals are the same as oil when they're not. Oil, of course, once we use it, it's burnt, it's gone, that's it. You can't reuse it. You know, it become carbon dioxide or whatever in the atmosphere. Um, minerals, of course, they're metals, they're kind of recyclable, depending. Some metals are more easily recyclable than others. Um, uh, but what does that mean? We know of the mineral deposit is sort of finite, but, um, but how do we take peak mineral thinking and actually really you know, take some of the thinking out of peak oil and apply that? And so a lot of the work I've been doing to really get at that and actually answer this big picture question is, 
well, what are the environmental impacts of mining and are we getting better or not? Um, so I'm a, I'm a data junkie. I love putting data sets together that really underpin everything. So <coughs> let's see where we go. And as I mentioned, you know, mineral resources, and you could put energy resources there as well. Um, we wouldn't be here without that, and that's obvious. Now, we can choose to, uh, what we mine. In Australia, we still have millions of tonnes of asbestos resources sitting in the ground that we know of, and we actively choose not to mine it because we know asbestos is a very nasty material. You know, I've actually visited one of Australia's very few asbestos sites, um, not realising it was an asbestos mine beforehand, but luckily it had been raining for the previous three days, so um, we felt sort of fairly safe and we very rarely got out of the car. But, um, but that's the thing. What do we mine? Where and how? And for a lot of things, it's terms and conditions. And for some things, it's like <coughs> increasingly things like coal. It's like, well, no, there has to be an end point. You know, because it's climate change or for some um, you know, communities in Australia, that end point is like, well, no, actually, um, you said you'd stop there. This is farmland, this is horse stud areas, this is big uh, wine yards, um, you know, wineries, uh, or national parks. So some of those limits may be very different in various places. But, but typically, if you look at globally, we're producing more of everything. Virtually everything. Hard, any of the find has actually gone down. Right? And so, you know, if you take a cup of water, there's only so much to start with. If you keep pulling stuff out, eventually it's going to go dry. Which means I will need that refill, but that's all right. But, um, but again, we're finding other cups around the place. Right? And so, although we know of more resources now than we used to, say, 50 years ago, what does that mean? How long do we keep this pattern going? And I think the industry always tend to say, oh, we find more, we develop new technology, um, and, you know, it, it, if we start to become scarce, the price will go up, and that'll make a whole bunch of extra resources economically. Well, yeah, there's truth in that. But that ignores the environmental and social cost. Right? And as... You know, and as we continue to grow production and so on, grades go down, everything, you know, the social and environmental costs go up. Right? And so that's really some of the sort of big picture uh, questions I think we need to you know, start looking at. Right. And that's really, <coughs> I guess, you know, where, where we're heading this century. We need to understand where we get the copper from. And mining value chains are much harder than, say, food or, or energy. Um, but increasingly, <coughs> people do want to know that. Look at Tiffany's. They will only buy diamonds that are certified where they're coming from, for example. But and quickly, it just um, this helps understand, hopefully. I, I hope, I'm assuming a lot of people haven't done um, sort of the engineering tools of life cycle assessment before. Correct? Conceptual, right. yeah. We know we've done conceptual. Yeah. So, pretty simply, um, if you're looking at applying life cycle assessment tools to, to mining, like what's the total amount of inputs, whether that be energy, materials, and so on, and then to calculate what the outputs are, so you know, energy, um, you could various pollution aspects, um, carbon or um, uh, toxicity or whatever. Right? And if you start to fiddle with the assessments and say, right, if you take 10% copper, 5 to 1% copper grade, then 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, then maybe 0.01% copper grade, and then look at how much energy. Obviously, if you're starting with 10% copper, you only need to mine 10 tonnes of ore, or just a tiny bit more than 10 tonnes of ore, to get a tonne of copper out. If you're mining 1%, probably need to mine about 110 tonnes. That's, that's exponential increase. 110 tonnes costs a lot more to mine, and process obviously in energy terms, than 10 tonnes. And if you go down to 0.1% and then 0.01%, um, you can go from there. And so that's pretty simple, very, and a lot of papers published on that. Right. This is from some colleagues of mine at um, CSIRO, um, both now retired, bless their hearts. Um, but again, you can see the basic pattern there that I was just talking through. So for energy and for carbon, um, and this is say for, um, for copper, <coughs> right. and so you can see both the energy, so that's an exponential. And most of our copper mines are typically around about here at the moment, globally. Right. So we're on that verge where we know we're going to start to see some very, very significant increases in energy in the future. And depending on um, where the energy comes from, in terms of, say, electricity and as well as, uh, say, uh, diesel fuel, will depend on what the uh, carbon footprint will be as well. Right? Now, <coughs> Hubbock, of course, is often credited with 
inventing the whole peak oil concept. Um, and what's probably extremely rarely acknowledged is that it was actually Hewitt. And Hewitt developed the concept from minerals, not from oil. Right? Uh, Hewitt published a paper in 1929, actually, which is actually um, very deep and confined. But um, that's where I mean, Hewitt was a contemporary of Hubbard. Um, and Hubbard started to say, well, actually, we know oil fields run out. You look at the eastern side of the states. They go up, they come down. Pretty simple. Add the water and apply it to the mainland of America. And he was pretty accurate. And a lot of people think that all he was trying to do was predict the shape of a curve so that he could predict at 1.11 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon here in Yerevan, um, oil supply would peak and then start going down. And that's not what he was worried about. Not at all. What he was worried about was this. Oil power society. Without that, what do we do? And if you look at the oil shocks that sort of came you know, 20 years later, um, you know, and the huge queues that used to exist at some of the um, you know, frantic buying of America during the open oil shocks. Um, this sort of concern about this shortage, well, what happens when you start to run out? You've got to replace it with some other energy source or some other technology. Now, his argument back then, or at least his sort of thinking back then, of course, was nuclear power. Now, how do you translate um, nuclear power, which is electricity, into a liquid petroleum fuel? I don't really know, but, um, but the concept, one energy resource starts to run out, so you have to find an alternative. Right? And so in some ways, that's where Hubbard was really getting at. He was worried about what actually happened when we start to run out. Now, if you think about America, America did peak, in its mainland anyway, um, in about 1971, literally within a year of Hubbard's prediction. Um, and of course, there's been a big oil importer ever since. Most of that comes from the Middle East and all the politics of that entails. That's exactly what Hubbard was getting at. Right. Now Skinner, 20 years later, because people you know, in the 70s when we had the Stockholm Conference for the Environment in 72, so there was a growing awareness of actually environmental issues. Um, and people were starting to say, well, hang on, we're going to run out. Because we're not. We're finding new, new deposits for pretty much everything all over, all over the world, except maybe lead zinc, but that's another story. But what um, Skinner said, that's right. And lithium. Lithium? Yeah, lithium is also going to No, 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 no. They're finding massive lithium deposits. I've, I've done research on that. I'll happily talk about that. Yeah. Uh, Australia, um, Canada. Okay. There's some in China. Um, China is not. Yeah, well, I can come back to that. But, but what, what Skinner basically said is typically for scarce metals, stuff that has a low average concentration in the Earth's crust, you have a bimodal, like a two sort of split um, concentration. <laughs> Well, you know, sort of distribution. What we're mining up here is our sulfide minerals that concentrate. So you take copper, maybe 25 parts per million in the crust, um, and take it all the way up to <coughs> well, 2,000 to 20,000 or more. Right? And so that's that sort of you know, higher grade. And that's literally what we're mining at the moment. <coughs> right? So, of course, if you, if you keep coming down this way, right, deposits. Typically, based on the geology, deposits often get bigger as the grade drops, right? the diffusive processes, the hydrothermal solutions or whatever that form the various mineral deposits, often that means the deposits get a lot bigger as the grades drop. But at some point, the, the size of the deposits um, becomes limited and the grades drop and the amount of contained metal actually starts to go back down again. Right? And so that's really what we're writing at the moment. And beyond that, of course, you hit effectively what um, Skinner called the mineralogical barrier, where you're changing from this concentrated and rich material to average crust of rock. And sure, if you look at average crust of rock and multiply that by the, the volumes of rock that we would have, there's an extraordinary amount of different metals, but that's sort of irrelevant because the energy you know, jump here to go from processing sulfides through to, say, aluminosilicates would be you know, thousands upon thousands of times higher. It's just ridiculously silly to even contemplate it. So really, this is where we have to concentrate our efforts on mining. I'll come back to that. So one of the things I guess I've been doing more recently, and over the last few years especially, is looking at these global assessments to actually say, well, how much do we have? So I'm kind of getting you know, a bit sick of people saying we're going to run out, because we're not. Historically, when you look at the evidence, the facts, we're not. Uh, we're still producing more with our water reserves, and we are finding um, <coughs> new deposits. Uh, and again, we've done this for a variety of metals now. So I'll quickly work through this. So that's just teragrams for people who are very fussy about their SI units, or in other words, million tons of copper. 
So if you look at USGS, this is their reserves. And for people who are sort of familiar enough with mining, there's the typical language is oil reserves, which is based on your mine plan. Might be about five or 10 years worth, maybe 20, depending on the mine. Um, and then your mineral resources are geologically known, but they haven't maybe got their, their mining lease or their maybe uneconomic at current prices. But geologically, they're known enough to be able to report, and they're fairly similar in characteristics. So at some point, we'd expect them to be mined. Right? But this is, when USGS report reserves, they're strictly talking all reserves only. Right? And so if we look at those numbers. Right? So what we did, for the, um, well, this is about five years ago now, we actually went through and said, right, out of all the mines around the world, um, let's add them all up. But we're going to use mineral resources, not oil reserves. Because when you're looking at a 50 year to 100 year time frame, um, that's really mineral resources. And we also know, um, when we're looking at modern mining, we do get good conversion. You explore, you discover a deposit, drill it up, quantify a model of mineral resource, do some mine planning, mine it, convert it into production. And commonly, you're producing more overall than your initial mineral resources or oil reserves anyway. So mineral resources are a pretty good indicator. Right? So, and quite well. And again, a dense table, it's in the paper. But of course, the headline number is this. So, just us from Melbourne, we've been able to effectively almost double what the USGS had. Right? Um, and that's actually a pretty limited assessment because there's some parts of the world, like Russia and China and Iran, where you just can't get reliable data. You just can't get the same data <coughs> and so on. Imagine the process of um, updating this, and we're already at 2.2 million. Well, 2,200 million, I should say. Right. Now, if you look at that, and plot it all up, and again, you can see it all right down the bottom, right? And that's remarkable. I nearly fell off my chair when I first plotted this graph, because it's the first time anyone has practically validated Skinner's mineralogical barrier. Right. Now, what stands out is the center of most of the copper deposits, so they tend to be higher grade, um, could often be quite big. Right. These are large porphyry systems, of which, of course, you've got some here, and it's um, operated by Zanga's um, and often huge amounts of copper contained in them. And this is where the Chile dominates example, for example, in um, America and Canada. Then you can see the uh, magnetic sulfide deposits. And these are typically nickel, copper, sometimes cobalt, um, and often platinum group elements. Now, South Africa alone um, would be the largest chunk of most of those magnetic sulfides. <coughs> but they tend to get much lower right? Copper tends to be a byproduct in those. Right? So it's not the main product that they're really after. So in South Africa, it's the platinum group elements. At Norilsk in Russia, it's, of course, nickel, uh, along with copper. And then they've got palladium and platinum as well. And so uh, there's always you know, different parts of the story, but what a perfect validation of Skinner's mineralogical barrier. Right, when you look at similar plots that we've done for nickel um, and for uh, cobalt, it's not quite as clear, but that's because there's a, you know, a more blurred line between major product and co product. And again, if you look at the trends over time, you can see the dominance of the USA. You know, as the world was electrifying and using copper a lot more, increasing growth in Chile, you know, and that's um, due to the fact that they have the, you know, large porphyry systems, but just the sheer scale as well, right, and that fits the geology. You can see the post-war boom thing settling down in the 80s, and then of course the China boom. Where's that going to go next? And again, one of the things I always sort of stop and think, how far do we project that forward? Should we build for 50 years? And it's pretty easy to put a regression on things. Just a, a linear, or if you're brave, you can put a, maybe an exponential or a power relationship on there, and just some sort of simple thing. But of course, we all know that uh, production over time is not just a function of time. You can see the depression, you know, you can see the effects there at the end of the Great Depression, there, the recession, um, and so on. So, of course, you know, economic issues, social, political issues, all of those can affect things. So, uh, but one of the things that un underpins all of that is great decline. And one of the things that I'm still stunned at, I was in a conference in Brussels last year, and, um, and there's still people from the industry who don't realise that great decline is actually happening. And I don't know why, because the evidence is absolutely stark. And they say, oh, it's not great decline, it's just technological change. It's like, well, no. 
Well, kind of, yes, we, there is technological change, but the actual world we're processing, you can see it in Australia, you know, going down, going up and down, a bit, and then you know, down. And you could look at America, you could look at anywhere. Every data, you know, every country I've ever been able to find data for, that pattern's pretty much the same. Hopefully, I'll be able to add in um, small little data set for our ones, because I've some data for them recently. But so, again, the, there's, there are aspects of this story. This era for Australia is copper oxides, 15, 20% right at the surface, very easily smelted, even using wood if you had to. But by the time you hit the 1890s, all of those deposits have been depleted. There were no real copper oxide deposits left at that time, although we have since found more. But, um, but they were left with these larger, but, um, uh, lower grade sulfites. Like sites like Mount Isle, Mount uh, Morgan, um, Cobar Field, and others. And they were abundant for their time. So they kept the industry going. May, may I ask a question in between? Yep. Uh, what, what is the percentage of the recycled uh, metal? In this uh, picture, because if you have the history of uh, mining, then uh, you have lots of uh, also deposits. Uh, I mean, uh, yep. uh, dumping, dumping different places. <coughs> so, just flip back for a sec. This is mine production. So that if you include um, smelter and refinery production, you generally add on about another 25 percent in total. So that, that's sort of a, a rough indicator of the extent of copper that's recycled globally. Um, there's probably a bit more than that, but statistics around recycling are, are really awkward, and they're, they're very inconsistent. So, <coughs> some metals are um, much better, but lead, it's about 80% or maybe 90%. But that's because there's such strict regulation around things like lead acid batteries in particular. Right? And so, um, yeah, particularly a lot of the work I do is just on the mining side, but my final slide's on recycling, so I'll show you. Now, one of the other things, I guess, as part of that consequence, is saying, well, we know from LCA, life cycle assessment, that as grades decline, energy, carbon, and you know, water costs should go up. And so, one of my, um, you know, my that stage final year students, uh, Stephen, um, who's now about halfway through his PhD, but he said, well, companies report this data, so let's ramp together. You can get their production data, so they're all grades, and they're all they process, how much copper they produce. Um, and you can get their, say, their energy and their carbon emissions. So I put it together. And, and again, nice sort of LCA graph. And again, you need to, the copper is not always you know, simple. Every site often has variations. So some are just a straight mine and concentrator. So such as flotation, for example. Some are a mine and a heat bleach only. Right? So sort of kind of a mine and a refinery. Others have both a mine, a mill, and a uh, smelter. And others have a refinery and a uh, hydrometallurgical leaching circuit as well. So, but again, you start adding smelters and refinery sections you know, onto a project, of course, that's going to up the, the energy and the carbon. <coughs> you sort of see that. The triangles here almost give you a, <coughs> another you know, curve up here. But again, we're starting to see as things are the same grade, with a lot of variation. That's understandable. For some parts of the world, they're hydro. Um, for some parts of the world, like Australia, it's dominantly coal in terms of where the electricity is coming from. So, you know, you expect some variation there for the carbon, but it still gives a good validation to the sort of thing. Now, one of the things I like to do. Sorry. Um, yep. Let me go back to you. Yeah, sure. There is a time factor. This is um, because we, we know from um, a lot of productions, uh, not necessarily mining, but a lot of production of metals. The carbon intensity has been going down with technological improvement. So how does this is one slice of time I'm assuming. This is one yep. period. So it, this is kind of yeah, the data that underpins this, this set is generally over about a 35-year period. Right? Um, but if you look at some of the individual mines, um, they're typically common. If you look at uh, plotting, say, this factor over time, carbon intensity over time, um, but often it's going up per total copper. For some sectors of the mining industry, for looking at aluminium and other areas, they have been pushing that down quite a lot. Like I think in Australia, it's come down almost half. So it's actually going up, the carbon intensity. Yeah. Okay. I haven't actually got those graphs in here, but um, I've got them in every uranium, but not for, for copper. But, um, yeah, so as much as, as, a, as a general principle, we often see that in some sectors of the mining industry, we're not seeing it in these sectors. And largely, I think, driven by grade decline, um, sometimes
sometimes it's driven by, uh, if you look at say, sites like Bingham or Escondida, um, the price goes up so they do a big pit wall cutback while the, the price is high. Um, I capitalise that into the pit. Um, and that gives them access to a bigger body of ore for you know, some years to come. And so you get this big hit in energy and carbon um, just because of mine planning like that. So we'll see that later with Rossing actually. Right. But it's, a, it's an excellent question. Right. Now, as I, as I mentioned, um, one of the things I like to do is I like to get my fingers dirty. You know, it's probably partly because my name's Mark, but um, I like to get out and see things for myself. Right, because that way I've actually seen it, I've been there, I've actually you know, put my fingers in that water or you know, stood on that table there sort of thing. But, and I like to think I'm pretty hardy. I, I've been to you know, some mine sites in Australia that are, I reckon, are, are world class in their pollution standards. Um, and this one is one of the smallest I've ever been to. And I really mean that. It's actually, I, when I went to this site, I often, I've often described it as the single most intensely polluting site I've ever been to. And, for people who can imagine Australia, um, I'll do a bit of an exercise here. Let's segment this screen. So the third to the left, that's all Western Australia. We've got the centre, which is Northern Territory, South Australia, and all the eastern states. So way over here in the middle, right near the border between Queensland and the Northern Territory. Just go 10 k's across the border into the Northern Territory. Um, this is where Red Bank is. It's um, extraordinarily remote. It's, um, Take you two days to drive there if you go over Brisbane, um, or about a day and a half from, uh, say, Darwin. Right, it's a um, small site, <coughs> probably about 100 metres there, so less than a kilometre overall. <coughs> about two and a half million tonnes of wine waste. And this is just the Google Earth image. Doesn't quite capture it here properly. You can start to see some of the colours here. Looks like salt's there, you can see the sort of reflection there. But this is what we saw when we got there. You know, for someone who's coming from a groundwater background and a mine waste pollution and things like that, uh, you know, I, I kind of get excited by these sites. It's, you can't get a more perfect textbook site. But the great tragedy of this site is that it only operated for two years in the 1990s. And although we have a bond you know, system and the, the regulation says that the company's supposed to put the money up front for rehabilitation. They never did. They were allowed to just start on the premise that, oh, you'll we'll make money, then you'll catch up. And of course, they went bankrupt before they even put a dollar away. And so now, of course, you've got, hard to know exactly, but probably 100 to 200 million dollar costs for the Ontario government. So, yeah, this is the creek. No macro vertebrate structure, no biodiversity, pretty much, except some very particular, maybe algae and, um, and things like that. But that, you know, all the hydroxides, and they actually look, well, what do you do with these sites? One approach is to say, well, still got a resource there, let's open it up and mine it. Okay, make sure you fix it in the process. But the problem is you've got massive liability to try and reopen a site like this. You know, huge cost to try and deal with acid mine drainage like this. And it's really remote, it's difficult. So when they looked at um, reopening it again a few years ago, um, they actually did an environmental study, and the concentrations in this river um, for people who have a good handle on these things, it'd be about almost 400 milligrams per litre copper, almost 400 milligrams per litre annual year here in the river already. Right. Now I know in, in Australia our drinking water standards would be about one milligram per litre for copper, our fresh water standards would be about 0.001. So we're hundreds of thousands of times higher than that. But what's also remarkable, this is the, the open cut, is that the gravel is so polluted that it's just sheeting straight through the wall like that. It's absolutely remarkable. And what it's doing uh, is from the open cut, it's obviously travelling this way. So <coughs> even though the drainage comes in down here, upstream of, in the, is actually polluted as well because of that migration through groundwater. You know, it's um, you know, the classic pollution cycles in some way. Finally, about a month ago, there was a, a junior company that still held the lease and the rights to mine, but of course they have no money and they won't go anywhere. And so the Northern Territory government has finally stepped in and said, right, we're taking back the lease and we're going to clean it up. Finally. Right, so, so what about the taxpayer expense, right? All the taxpayer's expense. But 
to credit to the Northern Territory, and I think these photos that we took you know, several years ago now um, help get in place a policy where the Northern Territory government puts a 1% levy on all existing mines across the Northern Territory, and that gets put into a central fund, which they're calling their mining legacy fund. So they've got to clean up sites. And there's not just this one, there's many others across the Northern Territory as well. But this one is um, very colourful and very obvious. Right. Now, again, one of the, the other areas I guess I've done a lot of work in is looking at uranium. And in the late 1990s, I was very heavily involved with um, community groups at the same time as working with KFC, um, looking at the, the science around uranium, looking at the grammar impacts. And Australia at that time was looking at approving its first in situ leach or solution based uh, mining for uranium. And so I went through all the research, looked at the, all the IAEA stuff, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and we're going through and saying, well, yeah, it leaves obviously a very lasting legacy, a very bad legacy in groundwater. Right. And the day after the mine got approved, you know, we go through this complex debate about the science and have they really assessed the groundwater system? Well, no, they hadn't. Um, had they assessed the geochemistry right? No, they hadn't. Um, I don't have to go into that, but complex debate about what really have they really got all of that right? Um, and the next day, you know, in the cartoon, in the paper, was this one. And I think it's always brought me back to earth because. What's the primary reason why I still oppose nuclear power and uranium mining? Well, it's actually got nothing to do with the mine itself. It's got everything to do with the use of the product. That product will either end up as nuclear power or as a bomb. I fundamentally think that a nuclear bomb, no one should have. I think they're fundamentally one of the most dangerous things we've ever invented. Right? And so really, in some ways, again, it's the use of the product. So, but again, separating those arguments out, because a lot of the arguments about the use of the product are, of course, yeah, political or, or moral in nature. And that's fine. We're all allowed to have our, I suppose, our different perspectives. But, so this is a history of uranium. You can see the Cold War boom. You know, things sort of start coming down as the US realised they had more than enough uranium, as did the Soviets. Um, as nuclear power starts to take off, there's a big um, thing. And of course, nuclear power didn't take off as much as was expected, and so things crashed. Um, in the 1990s, of course, you know, nuclear power and demand is up around here. Uh, <coughs> of course, that, that difference in, um, that's needed for nuclear reactors is then met by dismantling of um, nuclear weapons, uh, stockpiles, and so on. But you can see the role that various countries have played over time. Canada has typically played a strong role throughout the last 60 odd years. Australia, a very minor role. Um, we're the only country in the world that actively that, that happily invited someone to blow up nuclear weapons on our soil. And I mean that our Prime Minister at the time invited the British to come and blow up parts of Australia. Um, if you look at Kazakhstan, if you look at Tibet, if you look at the Marshall Islands, if you look at anywhere else around the world, um, nuclear weapons testing has been forced under military, um, you know, um, you know, various military ways. But um, Australia, we were a minor player. We did that primarily to try and see if we could get ourselves into the nuclear game. But, um, our efforts then were pretty small with uranium, but in the 70s, of course, we found these big, big deposits. You know, and so Australia, after a lot of debate, eventually mined, you know, started mining fuel. But, um, and of course, if you update that graph now, Kazakhstan will look like Chile. It's actually taken over about 60% of the world's uranium production. And there's always an exception to the rule. As I mentioned, grains typically decline. But uranium, typically, yes, they do, but not in Canada. If you look at Canada, the 60s to you know, the 80s was dominated by the Alec Lakefield in um, uh, central Ontario, which was, at that stage, they used to consider themselves the Saudi Arabia of the uranium world, had the biggest known reserves on the planet. Uh, <coughs> they only got to about half of them, actually. But in the 70s, they started discovering these rich, you know, unconformity deposits in, um, in uh, northern Saskatchewan that weren't just at 0.1 or 0.12%, they were starting at 0.55 or in the 80s at 20%. Right? Now, when you're looking at sites like MacArthur River and Cigar Lake, when you're dealing with a mine that's 20% uranium, um, that's kind of like dealing with a gold mine at 600 grand to the ton. Right? Average gold mines these days would be about half a gram to one gram to the ton. Right? So, but what they have to do in Canada, um, these mines like MacArthur River are so rich that they have to actually um, dilute the ore when they mill it. So they mine it at 20%, and they, they sort of mine it at MacArthur River, they truck it up to, say, Key Lake, then they have to dilute it with other rock in order to have the mill at the same So the average rate caps out now 
at around about 4 to 5 percent because of that dilution factor. But what that means is that the Elliott Lake deposits are un uneconomic. And they're now looking at those for rare earths instead. Um, we'll see whether that goes ahead or not. But, but again, a lot of these are fairly constant because of the nature of the geology. Australia is sort of up and down a fair bit because of the different mines. If you're looking at South Africa, that's the Woodwaters Rand Basin. That's a very large gold field, of course, but very low grade uranium. And so it's already been mined for gold, and so it's easy enough to process to get uranium out as well. Right. So in India, of course, is pretty much the um, low-crossing uranium mine. Again, a very large, low-grade project. <coughs> and again, the exact same replica of skin in the electrical barrier, but uranium is weird. You get these extraordinary outliers. Right, look at MacArthur River and Cigar Lake over here, these two projects in Canada. So it just, just goes to show you how freakish these sort of deposits are. In Australia, we have a project called Olympic Dam, um, and that has copper, uranium, gold, silver, rare earths, and well, also iron, but um, you wouldn't want to have a radioactive iron. Um, but at the moment, they get copper, uranium, gold, and silver. They don't bother with the rare earths. Um, right, but it's five times off that chart. Right, so it's phenomenally huge. So, and again, huge variety of different deposits. So really the questions are, you know, how much uranium we've got. It's looking at the environmental impacts. And again, you can plot it out this way, you know, a lot of scatter. You can see sort of the Olympic dams are way out here as well. And so it gives you a sense of the, the spread, I guess. Now, one of the things I guess that's important, as well, you know, Alan was getting at before, is when you're looking at um, energy and you know, carbon and water, um, since 2002, um, a lot more companies are now reporting globally. There were some companies who were starting that in about 95, 96. In Australia, Western Mining Corporation, or WMC, um, who operated a Olympic Dam, um, they started reporting in 95. And when they reported in 95, they started with five years of data. So you've got data going back to 91. Right, so quite a long-term data set to be able to play with. Now let's have a look at the effect of grade. So MacArthur River, the as mill ore, as opposed to the as mined ore, because they mine it and then they have to dilute it with other rock to, to mill it. Right, so about 3.9% uranium oxide. You can see that's sort of the electricity per tonne of ore. And part of the reason why that's a huge amount is because they have to actually freeze the rock. Very particular deposit, very fractured, incredibly strong railroad flows. And, so, um, and because they need to make sure that um, it's safe for workers and so on as well, they have to actually ground freeze the entire mine. An incredible engineering thing. Right? But when you've got a deposit of 20% and you only need to mine 50,000 tonnes of ore per year, you know, it's, a, it's a very different type of mining. But again, you can sort of follow through the numbers, so energy per tonne of ore, what that translates to, how to calculate the embodied energy of uranium. I know physicists would go through and say, oh, it's the, you could look at it from the, the energy release from fission or things like that, but it's not that simple. But so if you look at range up, and it's typically around 0.3%. Yeah, so that's a typical range, but again, tenfold difference. <coughs> the reason why Ranger doesn't have electricity data is it uses diesel for its power station. Um, and so it's the diesel uh, consumer size basically underpins everything. So they don't separate out their reporting that way. Right? Um, but again, so even though that you've got this incredibly high you know, energy intensity per tonne of ore, Right, it's offset by the fact that they need to mine 50,000 tonnes per year, whereas Ranger needs to mine 2.5 million tonnes. Right, so, but that grade factor means range is coming up higher. Right. Now, if you look at uh, Rossing in Namibia, and again, it's about a tenfold you know, lower grade here. Right. So, kilowatt hours, a bit more normal for mines. Right, and again, the, the energy per tonne of ore comes down, but the energy per tonne of uranium goes up. And again, it reflects that sort of um, LCA sort of approach, I guess. Right, so if you look at it, just again, plotting up ore grade versus, um, and say, unit you know, um, carbon dioxide emissions, you get that classic LCA graph. This, I suppose, is what Alan was asking about before. Um, you can see, if you look at the red line, so that's um, Olympic Dam, 17.4% is the average proportional value for uranium there. So typically, it's about 75% copper. About 10 or 6 or 8 percent gold and about 1 percent silver. Right, so, attributed that way. You get sort of 
up, down a bit, hard to say exactly, but if you look at the, um, the, the brown series here, Rossing, gradually going up and then huge jump. And that huge jump is simply that the uranium price went up so high, they did a big investment in actually excavating the pit bigger, so a pit more cut back, as the miners would call it. Um, <coughs> and so their waste rock stripping went up a lot, which meant their energy went up quite a lot as well, and therefore the carbon. But even if you look at other ones like uh, Ranger, it's going up as well. Uh, and again, as much as companies are investing in either newer technologies or new trucks or things like that, as we constantly chase our tail for lower ore grades, this is the end result. And I, mean, I, I can show other graphs as well for copper and other things. There are some examples where it does come down, you know, or where it's even fluctuating a lot, but typically, you know, gradually going up. And that's the challenge. So if you look at a couple of mines, this is an old mine. Um, it was mined in the 50s and 60s for uranium, a tiny bit of copper in Australia. You see one open cup there. This was a copper open cup, that was for uranium. There was another open cup there that's been back to it. This is Google Earth. But what I like about this is the fact that you can see active pollution on Google Earth. Uh, and I'm sure it's sort of been done for here in Armenia as well. But, but this site was rehabilitated. It was rehabilitated in the 1980s at a cost of around about I think $25 million then. So this is kind of what it looks like now. You can see all the classic colours of acid mine drainage. This is near Darwin, it's in the tropics. So not that far away from Indonesia, I guess. So the river shouldn't look like snow, but that's all salt. That's all the, you know, the groundwater that's contaminated and basically being sucked up into the, into the riverbed for a nuclear reaction. So it's basically acid mine drainage. Now what's sort of classic about this photo is that the salt not coming out of the bottom, it's coming out from up on the ledge. Now if we think about a sponge, if you've got a sponge and you put a plastic layer over the top, if that plastic layer is working, there should be no water getting in. Now if you're getting water coming out halfway up the side of that sponge, the only way you can get water coming out halfway up is if there's water behind it. And if there's water behind it, that means water's getting through, which means the whole rehabilitation has failed. So the covers that were put over the top to try and stop infiltration and minimise acid mine drainage have completely failed. Now one of the things they should have done was backfill that waste into the open cup. It would have been below the water table, rates of acid mine drainage would have been all lower. Right, so, and again we can kind of show some degree of forgiveness because it was 30 years ago. One of the very first sites in Australia where we've done this. Right, so we're learning the engineering and the you know, the degree to which we need to go to. But, um, they've since spent about another $15 million over the last five years on more studies, and then working out what they're going to do next. They have to go and do yet another round of rehabilitation. And I, you know, I think sometimes, you know, I've seen some bad sites in Australia, and I, you know, sometimes I think we're pretty, we're pretty unlucky, but I was scared when I went to the restaurant in South Africa. And I mean that, you know, because when you're looking at it, South Africa, they've got about 6 billion tonnes of tailors. That's gold, so, and also low grade uranium in there. So the dust that's blowing off here, the day just like today is here in Yerevan, it's a nice hot day, right? So you can see all the dust blowing over here, and that'd be fine silica dust. You've got millions of people who literally live around these things. Right? You've also got all the acid mine drains that's flowing everywhere, going straight down streets into game reserves. Um, in, uh, basically getting into the cradle of human kind world heritage site. Right? And um, how does South Africa fix that when government's got to balance other priorities in the social and environmental space, you know, and economic space? Now in one sense their gold industry is collapsing, um, they're no longer the biggest gold producer in the world. In some ways they're switching from gold to platinum, but of course with the ongoing increase in um, technology and so on, there's nowhere near as many jobs as there used to be. So in some ways, you know, South Africa's got a huge problem on its hands. And I think that some interesting, we put it on the back there, if you're going there as well, so it'll be interesting to turn the slide again, but that's some, um, that's a hard slide, how do you fix that? I don't know, like, there's some, some things, and there, there are certainly some examples that I've seen at conferences where um, mining companies have gone in and dug up these old tailings dams, because you can quantify them, they're about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 grams per tonne. You know, companies have it, and there's often low grade uranium for them as well. And so sometimes it's actually worth digging it up, processing it, getting more gold out. And some of the earlier tailings are probably richer in gold, say 0.5 or 1 gram per tonne. Right? 
putting it into an engineered tailing facility. Right? And then you fix the problem and make money in the process. So sometimes those things can work really well. Right? But it's not always easy. So another site is some start from Flowerstem in uh, the Czech Republic, which I visited some years ago, almost uh, four or eight years ago now. Um, then it was an in-situ leach site, uh, a soap video. Um, and that stage would have been almost 20 years, I think, of um, groundwater remediation to basically run standing still. I still haven't affected the outfit anywhere. But again, just, this is a, a chemical sludge dam and classic indicators of acidic drainage from the bottom. Crystal clear water and um, the iron oxyhydroxide um, precipitation, you know, rust. <coughs> now, quickly, there's a lot of these methods. I've already pointed to some of them. Um, just wanted to quickly go through some of these. But I think this is globally where things are moving, and this is maybe where you know Armenia um, could position itself. Oh, excuse me for a second, please. The previous slide. The previous slide. Previous slide. And you, oh, yeah. and you can stand next to it. I'm happy to leave a copy of these for you too. Thank well. you. You can help. Uh, and again, there's multiple ways to plot all of this, because really what we're trying to get at is to understand the relationships either between energy and, and carbon, um, water, what's happening over time, uh, how do you compare one metal to another. You know, um, so let's have a look at some examples. So this is uh, energy consumption in uh, gold, and again, a lot of stuff. But because gold companies report this, quite a lot of them and quite a lot of gold mines, you can get a huge amount of data. Right? Not too many at the high end. There is some for people who know their units. Um, that's almost three ounces per tonne. There was one mine in Canada that operated for about five years. Um, it hasn't been able to maintain that grade. It's just one little small pot of beef. Um, well, so very high grade ore. But again, you know, if you put the regression on there, it's not a great regression, but but again, the overall pattern's clear. Right. Now, in Australia, why does this matter? Because the industry and government have suddenly started to realise that not only are we talking about it at an individual mind sense, there's macroeconomic effects of all of this. Right. And so if you're looking at the actual energy consumption in economic terms, um, we're having to spend more and more energy on our mining um, for less and less return. Now, that's been masked in a lot of ways by the fact that the, the size of the mining industry has grown so enormously that it's often been a bit masked. So, really, we haven't got that much more efficient. Now, it does depend on which sector. There are some sectors, like the aluminium sector, that I think have got a lot more efficient. Um, but again, I think it probably does mean we're talking carbon or energy as well. Carbon, that's definitely come down. We may not, I'm not sure if energy is the same. But, um, but again, when you're looking at it, this stuff filters through and becomes a, a you know issue. Now, being a data junkie, I thought, well, hang on. Um, obviously, carbon is underpinned by energy, and really, you know, for people who know the old uh, internet sort of uh, sort of thing, red versus blue. So blue, that's say uh, renewable, so hydro, and then red, that's coal, that's bad. Um, how does it look? We plot it all up. And remarkably, it actually shows something you, you would actually expect. So your red ones, a higher carbon intensity for the same energy, uh, where you typically blue ones, be much lower. But not always that simple. You can find a red dot down here. You can find a blue dot up there. Right. And so I think what that shows is that we have to understand not only each mine. Some mines are much deeper, some mines are much older, some mines may be much newer, which means they've got new trucks or their pit isn't that big yet. And as pits get bigger and deeper and the haul roads get longer and the waste rock dumps get bigger, like either higher or further away, that all adds to the energy. Right. So but what you can see is that there are those broad relationships between energy and carbon. So for a, a unit energy intensity for the gold production, you can sort of give a, a good expectation of what the carbon might be. Now, one of the, the best examples, I think, that used to be around for sustainability reporting by mining was uh, Anglo Platinum, where the oh, platinum, obviously, <coughs> so mines, mills, smelters, and refineries, uh, the platinum group um, in an element mining process works very much akin to base metals, not actually, um, say, precious metals like one might 
to the fire can expect. But what they do is they give you energy, they also give you carbon, right? So, um, and that allows you to actually partition it properly. And so if you're operating just a mine and mill, you can just take these two parts, but if you're adding on the smelting and refining, you can then start to work it out. And so it actually gives you a really good basis on which to analyse. Okay? So, now one of the things, and this is the question that came up earlier, I guess, um, is if we're starting off from the premise that if mineral resource is finite, it's eventually going to run out, well, what do we do? And in some ways, we don't need to wait for it. And I think that was the point that Hubbard was always trying to make, is we can't afford to wait. We have to start planning and thinking about these things now. And if you look at Belin, um, of course the Swedish mining company, um, anyone know what Belin is famous for? Gold recycling for That's one thing, yeah. Anything else? <coughs> so that. What what's Belin famous for? <coughs> it's also differentiating himself from the other tool to mice because of these approach to environmental issues and why do they need to differentiate themselves though? You're getting closer. Um, the reason why we need to start dealing with environmental issues and things like this is because they had a massive trading zone collapse in Spain at Los Frailes in 98. Almost sent the back <laughs> And they started to realise that well actually environmental issues are really serious. You know, um, and they're very costly when they go wrong. Um, but also when they're looking at expanding their smelter segment, um, they realised that well um, if you look at a phone Let's, uh, now if you compare the grain, this is uh, ITIC, the copper gold mine up in northern Sweden. Not a lot of metals per tonne of rock. But look at a mobile phone. And not only does a mobile phone have copper gold and silver, it has um, europium, dysprosium, neodymium, lithium. The list goes on. Right? So I've got 60 elements to make that phone work. Right? Now, ironically, for a mobile phone, about 70% of the value is gold. By, by, by the amount that's used and just the fact that gold has an incredibly high price. So, to a recycler, the reason why you recycle phones is all about gold. A lot of people confuse the, you know, the issues saying, oh, we're running out of platinum, or we're running out of your rare earths, when there's thousands upon thousands of years of rare earth supply known. Um, we're not running out of any resource. What we're running out of is understanding the environmental impacts, the social constraints, and also what's the smartest option. Recycling is always generally an environmentally easier option, much less uh, energy intensive and much lower environmental impacts overall. All right. So, <coughs> you know, again, you could probably pull out more. I mean, if people want, I'm happy to leave copies of a lot of the papers that are in all of this. But, but for me, I guess where I've come to is it's not about how much we have left. Really, we know globally we have more than enough for virtually every metal I've ever looked at. The only one where, that I think would work on the revisions at the moment for a journal paper um, is the lead zinc sector. Right? And even that's a bit harder to sort of really get at because um, there's so much zinc across Central Asia that, that's uh, unreported or um, poorly documented, shall we say. Right? So I think globally, you know, when you look at all the metals we've ever looked at, we have heaps. Really the questions become what do we mine, where do we mine, how do we mine, uh, and how do we make sure we get the best balance out of it? Because when we're looking globally, of course we're going to need to mine you know, um, for some decades, I think, is, to meet infrastructure demands and the you know, reasonable demands of, of society going forward. Of course we're going to need to mine. It really comes down to which metals, where, how, and what are the environmental conditions. And, and for some projects, that may mean that there are no go zones. Windy Craggy in um, British Columbia and Canada was a very big copper deposit, or copper cobalt silver, actually. But, um, now inside a raw heritage area, never be mined. So, so again, for geologists, they get very excited at tons and grain and think, oh, good, we've discovered something. But it's not about that. And I think that's one of the things that I always um, am very excited at the opportunity when I'm travelling is to see local things myself. Because to see that context here, because it's actually really, really important. Right? So, part of the way that the global industry, of course, is starting to do that, um, and I think it's a really good initiative. Um, and direction is actually reporting on the sustainability performance. Some companies, there's more marketing, say that, I can always name them, but, but for some companies, really good data sets, really thorough, really professional, um, and really accurate. It allows you to um, really analyze things in detail and say, well, okay, how, how do we really understand these trends going forward? Right. And so, 
really, I think it's the social and environmental issues that we need to be monitoring on. And why are communities so concerned about new mining projects going forward? It's largely because with the old impacts uh, that are often still continuing. When Agricola was talking about the impacts in, a, um, in uh, the Erzgebirge, my bad German, but the All Mountains is the English translation, um, he was talking about acid rain drainage that have been around for hundreds of years. Right. So we know that these things go on and on. And that's why a lot of communities are saying no. Right. This increasing scale and in things like that. So um, I think that's where the real issues are. And so how do we come up with the regulatory systems, the corporate systems, the community systems, and so on? So just a few acknowledgements. Some of this works have been funded by SIRA over the years. Um, probably some other acknowledgements I should probably put in there too. But anyway, hopefully that's been uh, enjoyable for folks. Happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one thing that jumps, jumps up um, in my mind is uh, deep sea mining. It's a lot of talk around it. Um, it's all talk at the moment, yeah. yeah. Um, what are the th uh, what are the kind of the projections? Is it going to be a game changer? Is it going to be something about May? What, are, what do people it's expect? It's a paper in my head that I've fiddled with, but I haven't had a chance to finish putting together yet. Some of the resource data sets, like if we go back to the copper data set, there was not one deep sea resource in there. With the cobalt paper we did um, around about the same time, there's one resource you can put in there for cobalt. Right now, um, part of the problem, well, one of the issues that we always have to dance around when we're putting the papers together is the data that we use is mainly formally reported um, mineral resource data. So if you look in Australia, we have a, a formal code for reporting mineral resources, as does Canada, and you know, most countries around the world have some variation of a code. Um, no one has a real code for what it's been So there's geological estimates of how much is there. And some of those vary by two or three orders of magnitude. And I really do mean that level of variation um, because it depends on how you mine it. And some people are saying, well, you can't mine the whole seafloor. That's ridiculous. So the upper end probably going to come down. But it, it depends. If you're looking at um, <coughs> the seafloor massive sulfides, which is what people, the first project in the world that's getting close to deep sea mining, it's under construction at the moment. Um, the Solvara project in Papua New Guinea, um, it's just mining a seafloor massive sulfide. Now, for some numbers, let's go back in here. See, actually, Solvara is in the scrap oil that we get to talk to. Solvara would be one of these. It's probably going to be. Probably this one. Right. Now, if you look at the amount of copper that's got, it's 0.2. But right. if you look at Escondida and Andina and El Teniente, they have 100 million tons each. Right. So, um, now, even if you have Solwara, and at the moment there's only two of the vent systems of Solwara that have four more mineral resources reported, um, even if you add those up, it's 0.3 million tons of copper. Three mines in Chile have got 300. Right, and I think actually when we put this data set together, that uh, SMD was uh, 55, and it's since then gone 140. It's they've now added in Escondida East and um, Pan for Escondida and a couple other discoveries. But it's um, so I think you know I suppose getting around the point, but the grade is what drives the debate for deep sea mining. So the grade is so rich. Right, you've got high grade copper, high grade zinc or gold or whatever for these C4 massive sulfides, um, but they're really small. They're incredibly small. So those are just irrelevant. They're not part of the long-term future. But, um, the sort of sectors that, that could be useful but, um, are the, the nodules right? the, uh, and the seamount floors and so on. Now the nodules, um, they've got about similar grades. at 1% nickel, 1% copper, about 0.2% cobalt. That's pretty good for cobalt. Um, and they're hundreds of millions of tons or billions of tons. But what's mining them? A lot of that sits at 4K depth of water. Like, it, no one's ever mined that. So I, I, I think that it, there's a lot of drivers. One of my, my friends and colleagues that I work closely with in, in Australia, Charles Roach, who's um, oh, he's honorary executive director of the Mineral Policy Institute. I'm chair of the board for my sins as well. But um, 
He's done a lot of work on looking at that deep sea mining. For the Pacific, um, if you've got a mining project that's going to deliver even, let's just say, 50,000 tonnes of combined nickel, copper and cobalt, um, the value from that, the export value from that, would be multiples of their economy. You know, so for them, the, the driver is really economic. And, and it makes sense. Like it, it's actually, for, the, for a lot of the Pacific regions where these, some of these resources are, um, that's a very attractive driver. But the question still comes back, well, what's mineable? Now, if you're looking at modern mining, we go through this cycle where you, you drill it up, your mineral resource, you do your mining, then you actually look at how much you produce, then, then you make sure that, uh, okay, what you, you mine, you have a model that says there was X amount of tonnes of this much grade, and then what you put through the mill should be fairly similar. Right? We haven't done that for deep sea mining, we've never ever done it. Right? And so, a lot of the drivers on it um, are, are some people that I think misunderstand things. They're saying we're running out of land when we're not. They're saying that the environmental impacts are growing on land, which they are. Right? Um, and, you know, Samarco and Mount Polly and some of the tailings there disasters. There was one in Mexico which was as big as Samarco, but um, didn't get as much press because it wasn't the HP or Bali, but I'm just thinking of the name of it. But um, that were all over the last two years. So, yes, environmental impacts are growing. But I think for, so for deep sea resources, um, of people who are pushing it um, either misunderstand or, or misrepresent and always represent the drivers, right? But um, but I don't I don't see it as a big game changer. And, uh, uh, it's it's something that I think, given all the data sets that I've built, it's one of these papers that I've really got to get onto soon because it's it's a big issue. But it's um yeah, I, uh, hopefully that helps anyway. I don't know if it's a correct answer, but yeah. So, any other questions? Yeah. Let's imagine that uh, all copper. As uh, falsely as uh, not falsely, as minerals, is just over. Now everything is uh, relying on recycling. What would be then the cost of, uh, of uh, one kilo, one ton of uh, uh, copper? And uh, uh, will there be uh, some kind of loss that is? Uh, uh, not possible to rework. There's definitely going to be some losses in the system, you know. And I think that 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 this is some of the questions that I think people don't really have a good answer to yet. You know, like the work we've done, and I've, we've actually done work saying, well, let's take this resource data and model it forward for the next 50 years, you know, um, and then see what grades get to. And again, they start going down, or they continue to go down, but we'll, depends how you crunch numbers as to what rate they go down at. But um, but again, when you're looking at this sort of stuff going forward. Um, it also depends on the economics. <coughs> grade may go down faster because if you get into some of these porphyry oxide deposits that are lower grade, um, but they're cheaper to process, they're cheaper to mine. Right? And so, you know, putting all of that together and saying, well, how do you look at the recycling system? Copper, a lot of uses of copper are fairly pure copper. Pipes, um, electronics, Wires. cabling, there's a lot of things where copper's yeah, fairly pure in its use, um, and even some of that main alloys of bronze or you know brass. Uh, yeah, it's not too hard to recycle that, the copper out of that. Um, yeah, but there was always going to be some uses of copper where things get lost. You know, um, so how to model all of that and look at the full material flows and then model that. You know, so can we then sort of completely close the loop and have a complete circular economy? I know some of my colleagues uh, are always very confident on answering your question. I'm not, you know, I, I think there's, it's a, it's a sort of really complex question. You know, now, we, we, we know we can do a lot more with recycling, but, um, but what scale are we talking about as well? Like, sort of, Yerevan, Armenia, the lower Caucasus, Middle East, the world. Like, where, where do we draw that scale? You know, um, and scale matters on these things. So. You know, um, it's a, a, and I don't have any really good answer for that, but I, I've never seen anyone, and there are you know, papers out there which have actually looked at modeling using system dynamics models, um, these sorts of things. Um, but they make very simplistic assumptions around mining and resources, um, and they often aggregate base metals together, right, or make other very simplistic assumptions. And, and even limits to growth, as much as conceptually it's, sort of, it's been fairly accurate. It was very poor in the way it represented mining. You know, so 
Yeah. Well, roughly speaking, what is your sense? Is it going to be more expensive or less expensive? No, yeah, I really don't know about that. Okay. <coughs> what about uh, lithium? You, you mentioned that lithium is... Uh, uh, yeah. They have found... Uh, Someone give me some more, please. <coughs> found some deposits of uh, uh, lithium that uh, I recently, just recently, read that uh, li lithium <coughs> deposits are really scarce and most of them are in China and uh, um, in, in fact uh, the <coughs> renewable energy is uh, looking for storage possibilities and lithium is uh, one of the resources for that. I think so, there's a lot of arguments around that. <clears throat> and I think some of the arguments put out there by the fossil fuel industry say so renewable energy can never work. Right? And it's, that's lobbying, that's public you know, marketing and manipulation, whatever. But, um, but when you go through the facts, there's actually more cobalt in lithium ion batteries than there's lithium. Right? Now, there's a huge amount of cobalt around the world, you know, um, studies we've done. Um, but with lithium, th there's, there's two primary resources of lithium there's the lithium brides and the salt lakes. So basically lithium in solution, right, of which there's huge systems in South America and the Atacama Desert and, and elsewhere. Um, there's huge you know, um, brine systems in China um, and elsewhere, but they only barely started looking at that in Australia. And as soon as they started looking at it, they realized it's similar to all the other parts of the world. Right, so the other one, of course, um, now the, the brines are really good to process, um, but you've got to look at the chemistry, right, because the, it's the chemistry that makes it easy to process or not. Now, with it, say calcium and other things like that, the ratios between the say, lithium and so on, um, because some are um, like more difficult to progress, like magnesium will be more important. Yeah. Um, like when you're looking at the hard rock, uh, um, that's, say, spodumene, so basically lithium silicate mineral. Um, now, uh, that generally used in ceramics and glasses and so on. Right? And so it's, uh, you can take spodumene like a, the lithium silicate uh, mineral, and, and convert that through to lithium carbonate, which is then used to make lithium batteries. But generally, lithium brines um, are ones that go through chemically straight through to the lithium carbonate that make your batteries. Right? So, um, and the, the problem, mineral resource codes don't deal well with solutions. They're not designed to do that. They're designed to work on a hard rock tonnage of volume, density, a grade, and your mine plan, and that's what's mineable. Right? But when you're talking about um, complex variability in chemistry in, um, in brines, um, the codes don't really deal with it very easily. But not only that, you also got to look at recovery rates. Right? And so uh, there's not a lot of data out there on recovery rates around brines. Works, it's been produced out of South America and so on, but, um, but when you look at the numbers and the sheer size of some of the, the salt lake systems that are there, the resources are clearly huge. We've got, we've got papers published on this in the past, but um, so lithium, I think, although there are some people who are putting arguments that we don't have enough, they're confusing resources in the ground versus current mine supply. One mine in Australia supplies 25% of global lithium. Just one. Right? It's Greenbush in south of Perth. Right? Now, it's spodumene, right? so it goes basically to ceramics and glasses, and they've looked at actually converting it into lithium carbonate for batteries. Um, but they, um, you know, they've expanded quite a lot actually over the last 20 years. But, um, so I think when you look at it, the reality is, resources-wise, we've got heaps. No problem with that at all. Same with rare earth. Rare earth people often get you know, very sensitive about. And fair enough. Um, Tamarium um, is the stuff that's used on the military, um, the laser guidance military systems for the missiles that the US use. They don't want to be dependent on China for their laser guided missiles. That's understandable. Right? But of course, rare earth's also coming into this technology. They come into a lot of renewable energy technologies and so on as well. Now, current rare earth supply is around about 130,000 tonnes per year. Right? Was, did peak at about 150, but it's come down a tiny bit due to markets. But um, now we've just finished a, a global resource assessment for rare earths. Um, we found about at least 600 million. And we didn't even finish. We knew that you can get monazite and, um, from mineral sand, which is also used to be an important source for rare earths and so on. Um, and you can keep going. Right? And they've since found more. Right. So a lot of people mix up when they're talking about you know, resource criticality or metal, critica metal criticality and so on, um, and oh, we don't have enough for renewable energy, they're mixing up supply versus resources, or 
they have an agenda to deliberately mix up the perceptions around those things. So, because I think when you look at the basic facts, um, the resources are in the ground. Absolutely, like, no doubt about that whatsoever. I know there are some colleagues I know who still make the argument about um, things like silver. We don't have enough silver to make the solar panels. Where do you want me to start? Like copper, gold, um, nickel, um, you know, lead zinc deposits. There are silver only deposits. There is an extraordinary amount of silver out there. But the USGA statistics are reserves only. And so people misuse that, thinking, well, that's all we've got. Well, no, but they're all reserves only, not total mineral resources. And the fact that a lot of the data that the USGA has used, um, you know, and they have to be fair to them, they're under resourced. They used to be um, you know, a, a lot better resource in the past. Um, and a lot of the, their senior staff in our program was hiring. That corporate knowledge had just gone out the window, often along with the data sets. Right? And so, um, and I think the USGS is something starting to work out that they've got to modernise. They've got to really, you know, actually really update their thinking. Um, and as well as, I think, working with a lot more international agencies, you know, or groups around the world to say, well, look, we need a better system in place. So rather than constantly people saying we're going to run out, so we're not. Um, it's how do we set up systems to account for things better and then look at that trajectory so that we, you know, to recycle them um, and a, a better sort of circular economy in the long term. But it's a, it's a pretty big ambitious agenda. Obviously. So, but lithium, um, that's the thing you've got to really sort of split. It's the brine versus hard rock um, and then go from there. So, yep. So um, my, my comment maybe might be a bit philosophical, it concerns the amount of copper. Yep. I, I think the issue is there, there might also be an issue on the demand side. Maybe uh, there are now in, the, in now, in the research phase, there are more, much more efficient materials than copper. For example, copper wirings could be, within the next few years, replaced by <coughs> carbon nanotubes, CNTs, yep. which are... And, also, maybe within the next 30 years, you might also find with the wireless uh, power transfers, you, you won't need um, wiring anymore. So that that might create an uh, amount of scrap of uh, copper, which which is humongous. If, if so, so what do you think? Um, how will this amount of scrap copper uh, play into the role of? Mining demands, for example, or demand for ore. Do you think that might affect this? Yeah, of course it will. Yeah. Um, and, and some of these things, um, I'm sure Kodak's a familiar name here. Yeah. Right. It still um, is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's Kodak, still. of course, um, you know, camera films and things like that. Um, their CEO in the 1990s said digital will never get anywhere. Killed his company, completely killed his company. Silver, yeah. um, uh, the, the amount of silver used in photography is um, negligible compared to what it used to be you know, 10, 20 years ago. Right? Um, but total silver demand is actually still up right? because the uses of silver has changed. Now, that's a particular one, right? but um, now when you're looking at copper, in Australia, I'm not quite sure where Armenia is up to, but in Australia they're, they're gradually at a very slow pace. Um, I think Armenia is probably got better internet speeds than we do. I mean, we're number 60 in the world, but it's actually we're ridiculously slow. But um, they're gradually getting rid of copper wire for telephones and bringing in exactly. optical fiber. Exactly. Right. Um, <coughs> but even if you look at that, the amount of copper in the, the stocks, you know, telecommunication stocks in Australia, is literally about half a million tons. Right. Um, so it's in global copper terms, it's not huge. Now, in local supply terms in Australia, it's useful. Right, but it's coming through at such a slow rate, it, it's very easy to absorb by the scrap market and so on. Now, but again, I mean, I think what you're getting at is exactly what Harvard was thinking through as well. Right, is that sort of, well, that, that sort of strategy where you're moving from one system to another. Right, and you have to plan that. Yeah. Like, that's sort of, I guess that's what you're getting at as well. It's like, well, you know, you, you have to plan your goal and then sort of work your way towards that. Now, you can either set your goal and then work out how you get back to it, like backcasting as it would be called in sustainability. We can say, well, we're here now, we want to push ourselves down to hit a particular target, so go out there forecasting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and some of those things that may well be the, um, the new energy technologies, um, looking at the, um, the you know, wind turbines, um, people say, oh, if you use rare earth in them, you use less steel. Yeah, but you use more copper. So, 
you know, there, there's push pull, like there's things that push things up, push things down. Um, not always easy to predict that, you know. Um, but I suppose the aggregate effect at the moment is that you know total demand is still growing up. So at some point, you know, globally, whether it's the amount of metal per person or whatever, we get that sort of much better distribution worldwide. Then it's such a approach what you're, what you're asking about. Yeah. It's, it's a good question. I don't have any great answers, but hopefully that gives some yeah, good thoughts. Yeah. Yep. Uh, getting, getting back to this Responsibly modern, 
probably however we want. So what do you think, how far we are from, uh, from, a time, from the time when metals also will be sort of, I don't know, certified or somehow knowledge mm -hmm. that it's coming from a responsible side <coughs> because this kind of thing may force companies to act responsibly so they are yep. certified. That's a really good question. Um, hard to say. Gold, it's kind of... Gold's probably going to be closer than others yeah. because it's sort of, um, so much more high profile, so much more of his mind in, in the developing world. Um, but also, jewelers are driving it, whether he's looking at a ring or whatever. So, I um, mean, it's just platinum, platinum silver, actually. But anyway, um, but other metals, it's hard. I don't, the value chain with mining makes it hard. But, the, um, but Irma, which is the um, initiative, initiative for responsible mining assurance, um, they're working on that. And they're, um, they've been around for a long time, about 10 years now. But, um, but they're really starting to ramp up. And they've actually got Microsoft on board. Um, as well as Tiffany's and um, I think Anglo Americans still involved, and one of the very few miners still left. But um, good miners actually were saying, well, yeah, well, we recognise that this is actually just a good thing to do. You know, it's good for our business image and things like that. So more responsible wise. Some companies like Rio and BHP are not involved, which sort of gives you a sense of actually how much they value that. You know, um, so, but certainly when you're looking at it, um, some of the consumers now, like um, you know, like Microsoft. Um, I can't remember if Apple's also joined over or not, but, um, but Microsoft definitely have. But, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a really good question. I, I don't know exactly. I, it's well, it's it a trend that's coming. Yeah, it, it should come probably through the value chain or the you know, supply chain or whatever it is. Anyways, I think it would be a good opportunity for mining companies to become more responsible. I think my second question was about the performance and the uh, level of development of countries. Let's say we have uh, we have uh, telling standards in many parts of the world and including Canada, US or UK countries, but also in other countries. So are there any studies or have you come across with such studies that or your feelings that it really depends on the development of the country where you have poor performance or better performance or it's just about the mining? I know exactly I mean, what you're getting at. The and, country, um, is the country, I mean, it's factor in its performance? I, I think more than anything, it, it's the, the strength of the engineers involved. Right? You can have, um, uh, if you look at Mount Poly, Mount Poly, <coughs> people would think Canada is a well regulated mining nation. You still got Mount Poly. You know, um, We've had tailing sand failures in Australia, but actually, this wasn't a tailing sand failure, this was a heat leach failure. Right? Um, and it's quite a classic case that you had done. He had two borders straight down the middle. Um, right? 2009, that happened. So, excuse me, second. Um, now, the 50 kilometres downstream, that was actually, um, thing like, if you think, I'm not quite sure what the term would be here in Armenia, but in Australia, in farms or big cattle stations out in the outback, have these six foot steel poles that hold your fence together, like star pickets as we call them, so little um, triangular cross section star, star pickets we call them. Right? So six foot steel pickets like that, um, used to create fences to hold cattle in, um, they were dissolved, completely dissolved. Right, because this failed. Hardly anyone's ever heard of it. It's called the Lady Annie disaster. Right, because the mine was Lady Annie. But again, something like the same thing. That company had gone bankrupt. Um, the bond, Queensland government was, oh, but we have a $10 million bond. It's only $10 million, and that's a bond. It's not disaster or insurance for an accident. You know, I remember thinking, this, you know, but. So people think that we're well regulated. So I think, you know, to be fair, I think if you've got good engineers, that's much more important than any good regulation. Like when Mount Poly failed back in 2014 in Canada, um, one of the things that came out very quickly was that the engineers involved um, had actually withdrawn their services from the company two years before it failed because they knew it was going to fail soon. 
um, and the company was not implementing what they had been asked to do. Right? And, um, and, so, and this is an engineering company, consultants. They don't walk away from a big client easily. Right? It got that bad that they had to. Right, because I could see the writing on the wall. Yeah, but right. this kind of this, you know, this very strict regulation also helps. Yeah, and that was so. I mean, in this case, let's say yep. they could release some water, probably from the tailings, and it's may prevent. I don't know if it will well, or not, but it may. Yeah, I mean, the basic problem there is that the, the regulators were as much involved as the company. Right now, with the Mount Polytailings dam, um, when it was designed back in the seventies, um, it was built on weak foundations. Right, and it was only designed to go so big. Problem is, it's been supersized since then. This big, right, and it's operating under, under a set of sort of operating parameters. Um, and the water level was right at the top of the dam too, so it was maximum pore pressure. It was like it was a disaster waiting to happen. Right, so um, I mean, the engineers knew that, and they said, "You've got to get in. You've got to reinforce this side. You've got to you know, do some you know, grafting works in the foundations." That had all been, in the, you know, after the accident, they had the inquiry report. That was all proven, but. Where was the regulator? You know, so the company, when they, the engineering company, when they actually withdrew their services, wrote to the regulator and said, um, "We're withdrawing our services from this from this mine. Um, we'd like to help you." Very diplomatic, but it should have been blindly obvious, you know, and stuff. So I, I think, you know, it's easy to say that developing countries don't have as good standards as, as you know, say developed countries. Um, I think that's an easy assumption to make. I think the actual evidence is if you look on volumes, the bigger accidents generally happen in developed countries anyway. Right? Um, but again, some of it depends on how you draw the boundaries there. But it's, I think it comes down to the strength of the engineering. Sorry. If I can briefly comment on that, uh, if I can briefly comment on this yep. question, because it's really very interesting. Yes, economic development might have links, but it's more like a regulatory framework. Uh, directly linked to the standards you mentioned. Canada's got the standards, they're just really forced. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and that's the problem. And developed countries can't afford themselves, so to say, having higher standards yeah. and strict regulations, environmental, etc. Yeah. Uh, they are not afraid of cutting the investment uh, flow or whatever. If, uh, well, it's easy to say that. It rarely ever happens. Right? It rarely ever happens. So, um, so in theory, yes, we, we have a better regulatory framework, and, but um, that's useless if it's not enforceable, right? And if it's not enforced with independence by the regulator, without fear of fin retribution by the minister, um, and unfortunately, politics is politics. You know, departments don't like going against the minister or making the minister unhappy. That's universal. That's that's the same thing. Okay. You know, so you know, it's um, <coughs> so it, it, it's. It's not simple, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Anyway, I think so my voice is about to give up. Are the right engineers is the best solution to the improvement of performance of funding companies, you would say? Yeah, well, I think, um, <coughs> I didn't actually put it in here, but... So what is the thing so I think it's possible? Well, What's the answer to this question? Yeah, I don't know. But, but one of the things that I've seen in some sustainability reports is companies do put targets in there. You know, engineers are pretty good at meeting targets when you give them numbers. You know, um, you know, same as accountants and managers can often be pretty good at actually trying to achieve targets on the financial side of things. You know, and stuff. But um, but for the environmental side of you know, sustainability things, it's like, well, you know, a target is a magic number. You know, um, so but sometimes you know if you're looking at it, so that way you can drive you know better performance. I think it, you know you can use these methods do that so it's um it's an ongoing journey I guess. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much.